the opportunity to give my talk on stochastic watershed models for hydrologic risk management. This is a topic that I've been working on for quite some time, along with a few colleagues, John LaMontagne, my uh, replacement on the faculty at Tufts, along with his PhD student, Ghazal Shabastanpour, and one of my previous PhD students who's at the US Geological Survey, Will Farmer. I've been working on this problem because in my opinion, the, the future of our field depends on uh, the idea that I developed in this article in 2017 of using stochastic watershed models, because you know, to enable risk-based planning it is, is actually an essential feature of our field. Um, so I have a series of papers in progress on this topic. Uh, uh, I, the idea is these deterministic watershed models, which many people are familiar with, obviously, uh, they, and they'll play an increasing role in our field because they can account for all the things other models can't, the interactions between climate, land use, water use, and so on. And they can also do that at different spatial and temporal scales, important to uh, uh, planning and design. However, deterministic watershed models can't, be, can, can't produce the time series or ensembles. They only generate a single trace, which is not uh, enough for hydrologic risk management. And furthermore, they generate biased estimates of the extreme events, which is problematic. Uh, is, is severely problematic in practice. And the idea is these stochastic watershed models can enable and, and, and get around that those issues. Now, deterministic watershed models are pervasive. I mean, we, we many of you have seen these textbooks by some of our favorite researchers in the field, summarizing literally dozens of rainfall runoff models, also called watershed models. Uh, chapters of different models, and they've been around for a long time, and they're, they're increasingly uh, sophisticated in time and space scales, and they're wonderful tools. So the question is, how can we use them in the proper framework to extend uh, their applicability to risk-based planning you know, over long-range periods? Well, stochastic watershed models are basically deterministic watershed model combined with a stochastic model of the inputs to the model, as well as a stochastic model of the errors that were calibrated or minimized when the model was calibrated. And the idea is that the deterministic model is then adapted to enable generation of stream flow ensembles, improvements in the simulation of extreme events, and all in the context of long range planning. And I say that because it is routine to generate ensembles from rainfall runoff models for short-term flood forecasting. That is a literal industry, and there are conferences and textbooks on that subject, but there are literally, I mean, there's less than a, a half a dozen papers that have talked about doing this, uh, you know, very small literature on doing this for long-range planning. So this is why I'm pushing this. I'm trying to push this, this idea for the future of our field. Now, where do the, these ideas come from? Originally, stochastic streamflow models were, were uh, intended for the generation of ensembles. Uh, when you didn't have a planning horizon, when you had a planning horizon which may be longer or shorter than the actual arbitrary length of the observed record. So it would enable one to simulate uh, conditions over that are experienced outside the window of the historical flows. And it would enable the use of risk-based planning methods, of which there are many and increasingly large number in, in, in this state of our practice. So stochastic watershed models can actually do all those things that the original stochastic streamflow models were intended, but they can also do that with an accounting for climate variability and change, water use and water infrastructure, land cover changes, operational issues, all the various things that these models are so wonderful at working at doing, it's particularly at high spatial and temporal resolution. Um, and so it, in, it, it will enable, in, in some sense, another revolution in our field, similar to the way stochastic streamflow models revolutionized hydrology back in the previous century. If you recall in the previous century, a model by the name of the Thomas Fury model, of which there are many others, and I list the names of some of the famous stochastic hydrologists who developed models of all different, all kinds of models of this form. But the idea of these models is, <clears throat> in this case of this, uh, of, uh, you know, from the previous century, they were mostly monthly streamflow models, as, as in the case of the Thomas Fury model. <clears throat> in fact, many of those models 
were developed by public agencies, monthly stochastic stream flow models in the, in the United States by the U.S. Corps of Engineers, by uh, Stedinger, by the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. And more recently, there are more generalized packages, and I couldn't do justice to the entire field here. I'm just giving a really brief overview. Uh, very uh, recent and, and very important stochastic uh, model is the, that developed by uh, Simon Paplexio called Cosmos. It's ideally suited to generation of watershed model inputs at, and, and uh, including all the different climate inputs as well as model errors. <clears throat> However, all of these models, or I should say none of these models can account for the impact of, of all the external effects, the extra exogenous effects. So for example, they all are of this class of what I would call a traditional stochastic stream flow model in the sense that they are based primarily on the variable of interest. In other words, in the case of stream flow, it's a stream flow depends on previous values of stream flow. What is needed are uh, stochastic watershed models, which really look quite similar, but they have inputs, climatic inputs. They also have uh, para model parameter set, which, uh, which, which, which depends on the physics and, and the hydrologic processes. So the idea is that these stochastic watershed models have the same application as did any deterministic watershed model, but in a risk-based framework. For just about any of the problems and challenges which pose posed by our field. In fact, if one goes through the list of uh, conference presentations at this very conference, you'll find that stochastic watershed models would apply to, to nearly every uh, presentation at this conference. Okay, before I actually launch into uh, how to build a stochastic watershed model, let me tell you what happens if you don't use a stochastic watershed model. So this is based on a paper back in 2016, where we calibrated uh, uh, the national USGS model to 1,225 basins. And we'll be using this, these uh, sites throughout this talk. And then we evaluated the systematic bias and design events computed from the output of the deterministic simulation model. This is what is done in practice. Now, this is what people do all the time. In fact, I've read many uh, papers by famous hydrologists to compare uh, design events from the output of rainfall runoff models. And they did not account for this effect that I'm just about to show you. So what we did here is each circle is a river basin, one of those 1,225. And each plot, you'll see at the upper left, is the two-year, 10-year, 100-year, and 1,000-year events. And what you see um, is on the left, on the y-axis, the uh, error in the design event, the 2, 10, or 100, and so on, versus the Nash Sutcliffe. And what you uh, notice throughout, regardless of the design event, is that there's a systematic downward bias in the flood quantiles that are estimated from, in other words, the, the quantiles, uh, of the 100-year event, estimated from the output of the deterministic simulation model is generally lower, uh, as much as 50% smaller than the observations themselves. This is a problem. This would also happen with low flows. With low flows, actually, instead of a downward bias, there's an upward bias. Uh, and and we, we our paper deals with all that. I, I don't have, have a time to go through it. But the idea, the goal of stochastic watershed model is to remove this bias. That's one of the goals. So what are we going to, how are we going to do this? We're going to use an aggregated approach to the generated generation of stream flow ensembles using post-processing. So what is post-processing? It involves the addition, the reintroduction re of the residuals that were used to calibrate the model, but bring them back, add them to the conditional mean stream flow output. And the idea is that that can be used, and you can do that over and over to generate ensembles. And those ensembles can then be used for risk-based planning uh, in a wide range of activities. Now, in order to do this, we have to first build a stochastic model of the watershed model error. And so what we've done here is we have a, 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 a brief look into this using those same sites that we I just reported, the USGS model, the 1,225 sites. And what we're doing is now we're going, those calibrated models at each site, we're going to look at the model errors and look at their distributional properties, look at their, their persistence, and look at their heteroscedasticity. 
Now, uh, this could be a talk in itself, but uh, sorry, I, I have to go quickly because I have so much more to cover in addition to this. So first of all, uh, at the, uh, what, what you see here are L moment diagrams, which are plots of the theoretical uh, L kurtosis versus the theoretical L skew shown uh, with those curves for various distributions. For comparison, we also report the values of the L kurtosis and L skew for each of those 1,225 sites, where in the upper right corner, we have the differenced residuals, where S are the simulations and O are the observations. And so this is a very important story at the upper right. What you see is that there's a very high kurtosis associated, almost zero skew as you'd expect, but very heavy tails. And believe me, I have a paper, when I saw this, by the way, this has now transformed my research program. I am now working on this problem in spades. I have a paper on the impact of heavy tails on hydrologic statistics. It turns out that uh, many statistical methods fail, including ones that you're using all the time, like the bootstrap and uh, the central limit theorem and so forth, all fail under heavy tails of this nature. Um, importantly, just by taking logarithms, we get normally distributed residuals. And so we can work in a space where it makes a lot more sense. I will tell you right now, based on these results, do not ever work in real space. Uh, do not ever try to calibrate a, a rainfall runoff model a day, at the daily scale or daily or sub-daily scale. Um, finally, even the residuals of a model of those lambdas. So if you model those lambdas use an autoregressive process, even the residuals of that are, are better behaved than the real space residuals. Next, we look at the persistence. What you see here are plots of autocorrelation. These are called correlograms. And what you see is that for the real space uh, res uh, difference residuals, D, as well as the log space residuals, you see an autoregressive process. And when we actually fit um, the nearest neighbor blue strap, and we then generate, it's very simple, then you generate stochastic simulations with those generated lambdas. And there's a need for a slight bias correction because when you retransform from real space back from log space back to real space, there's transformation bias. But that's a derived bias correction. So it depends on the normality of lambda, which is another thing we need to check. Now that brings up what to check, how to check. Well, evaluating a model is very different from evaluating ensembles that are generated from that model. And this was written by a topic that was written on by Jerry Stedinger, my PhD advisor, back in 1982, where he defined the validation and verification of, of, uh, of stochastic streamflow models, which is what I'm talking about here. Now, it, to apply the concepts that he developed in that paper, let me just uh, um, emphasize that it would, in this case, mean verification would imply verifying that the assumptions inherent in the development of our model are correct in this case that, that the residuals from an AR3 model are approximately independent and identically distributed. And then more importantly, the validation would, in, 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 would, would involve looking at all the different tasks that hydrologists are concerned with and whether or not the model ensembles can reproduce the um, statistical behavior based on the observations. And here is where, our approach really differs from uh, the literature, as you'll see in a moment. And let me use a case study to emphasize our, um, uh, our findings, our, our approach. First, I, I, I introduce uh, the deterministic simulation results for a single basin. So this is a single basin in Northern Massachusetts. And we look here at the uh, uh, three different uh, common statistics where the green are the observations and the black are the simulations, the output, single simulation output from this USGS model. And what you see is we reproduce the flow duration curve, as well as the probability distribution of the annual maximum floods, as well as that probability distribution of the annual minimum floods. And, you know, the goodness of fit is evidenced by the Nash Sutcliffe and the Quinn Guckter are reasonable. Uh, not great, reasonable. This is supposed, the idea here is this is a typical example. 
And this, again, all the results, um, the previous results, again, were for 1,225 basins. So I emphasize right now, I'm just looking at this one basin, which is that the, given by those solid points in the L moment di diagram. So again, you can see these are the same L moment diagrams I showed you earlier for the model errors at all those sites, USGS 1,225. And you can see the Squanicook looked just like right sort of in the middle of all the others where the residuals, the lambdas are really close to normally distributed. Um, and that's uh, shown um, in, in those three cases. So let's look at the normality of the residuals, the lambdas versus the difference residuals. These are probability plots. And what you see on the left is a normal, well, you see a normal probability plot on both in both the left and the right. And what you see is that the, the uh, log space residuals are well uh, approximated by a normal distribution. Whereas on the right, you see that uh, there are some serious problems with the, uh, in, in terms of normality. They're, 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 the uh, difference residuals aren't even close to normal and they have incredibly heavy tails. Um, verification that the auto that the uh, indep that the residuals of the lambda model, the epsilons, are approximately independent is provided here, but shown that the autocorrelations are roughly zero. Um, and then we look at what one normally looks at are so-called coverage probabilities. And here, what you see are this is a simulation. This is just a portion of the simulation. This is the most challenging time period in our case was the two-year drought of record. And so I'm just showing the worst case results of, 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 of all of our simulations. And so what you see here, are the black again, are the, um, obs are, are the deterministic output from the simulation model. The green are the original observations. And then those gray and yellow are, are prediction intervals, really, which were created by the ensembles. And what you find, first of all, and importantly, is that the observations green are, 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 are within the ensembles pr pretty much always. And that's the important. That's the important result. That, that that's important that that the ensembles enclose because the ensemble uh, generate uh, random confidence intervals so, or random prediction intervals, and so they should enclose the observations, and they appear to do so. Similarly, we can look at all kinds of other statistics of interest, like the seven-day, ten-year low flow. Uh, and here's the distribution of the annual minimum seven-day low flow compared with the ensembles in gray versus compared with the observations again in green and the ensembles enclose all of the observations and that's what's important again that's true for the floods the ensembles enclose all of the observations which again is really important and then we look at the storage yield curve. This is a very taxing uh, of the model because when you fit a storage yield, when you try to estimate the storage yield curve, which is a storage as a function of the annual inflow to the reservoir, sort of a uh, arbitrary reservoir as a function of the yield uh, ratio. On the right, what you see is enormous variability exposed by the uh, ensembles and that's to be expected, but importantly, the observations fit, fall within those ensembles. Um, and again, the same with the flow duration curve. You see the ensemble uh, confidence intervals are quite narrow, and yet they still enclose uh, the um, observations. Now, one of the most important ingredients, and I'd like to end with this, is the results on design flows. So what we're going to look at here is the 100 year design event, which is computed in this case from uh, uh, the, in the green is the result for the observations and the black line is the result of the deterministic output. And again, what you see is the difference between the green line and the black line is a downward bias of about 50% actually. What, what that, that's very similar to what we reported earlier for the 1225 sites, in other words, in general, the deterministic uh, uh, 100, the hundred year flood computed from deterministic output is going to be smaller uh, than 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 the observations in general. And if it were we were looking at low flows, it would be the opposite. It would be higher instead of smaller. Um, now, the gray histogram is obtained from the ensembles generated from the stochastic uh, watershed model. And what you see here is that the mode of those ensembles is very close to the observation, the, the observed 100-year flood. And this is generally going to be the case. 
and it, it, it points to the importance of using post-processing for estimating design events. And so here I summarize all of this in a table form across all the different design events, starting with the 500, the 150, 102. What you see here, and very importantly, is that the de deterministic watershed model has a lot of error in it, but that is reduced considerably by using the mode of the stochastic ensembles. And that's true for all the flood flows as well as for the design uh, for the low flows. But what I've reported here is the tip of the iceberg. I've only shown how to, uh, to do post-processing with the model residuals. One should also generate other components of the uh, model, including all the climate inputs, other inputs like water withdrawals, and as well as model error, all as random variables. So that that is uh, what needs to be done. It, you know, that's what the sequel to this should be. Um, so in summary, stochastic watershed models are needed because they can account for all the complex interactions between climate, land use, and so forth and because they can generate ensembles, which are a prerequisite to uh, important uh, uh, to long-range risk-based uh, hydrologic design planning and management. And finally, they can improve, they result in improved estimates of both flood and drought design events when compared to the strict use of deterministic models. Thanks for listening.